autistic branch in the Division of Diabetes, and he serves as a chief epidemiologist in this area. Um, and it looks like if you look through, he does, he's, he's accumulating data, he's processing the data, he's then going with the rest of his division and coming out with answers of what we need to do about diabetes, and I was impressed with his workload. Uh, his education background started with uh, going to college at William and Mary, he went from there to Wake Forest to get his master's, and then he got his PhD in epidemiology from the University of Pittsburgh. And we're certainly glad to have you open. I'll give talk about Ann just briefly, and then uh, the other speaker today is Ann Albright, who has a PhD in RD, and she's the director of the division of diabetes translation in, in the Center for Disease Control. She was out in California at first, uh, where she was there as head of one of the California Department of Health Services and looking at diabetes. And then from there, she went to the Institute of Health and Aging at the University of California in San Francisco. And she serves as a, the chief senior health policy advisor in the office of the United States Surgeon General. And she is also an expert in diabetes and will share the things that they're trying to do is set up partnerships and carry this thing of diabetes prevention and diabetes management around the world. We're most delighted to have both of you. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's an absolute treat to be here. Um, um, Ann and I are going to tag team this talk. Um, just as a brief background, I've been at, came to CDC as a staff epidemiologist about 21 years ago, and at the time I remember actually driving south. I'd been at uh, a brief stint at University of Vermont, and I was driving south, um, so it was 1997, and I pulled off to, to get some gas and, and picked up USA Today, and I read about the the group that I was going to work with, and they, well, an article by the group, but what it was actually was the first report of a nationally representative data showing an increase in diabetes incidence. And, you know, I, I that was sort of a, a taste of what I was getting myself into, and it's interesting that um, although now we go back and we can actually look at data that shows that we actually have observations of increases back in the, in the 50s and 60s, but that was the first time that we uh, published that from CDC, and that was the first time that we really started to think about diabetes as a public health problem. At that point, we thought of it as a complex clinical problem. Um, since that time, though, and really the 10 years that followed after that, the focus, the public health focus, was still on preventing complications. It's really only been the last 10 years that um, the, you know, we've really got wind behind our sails to, to tackle diabetes and its prevention as a public health problem. You're going to hear primarily from Ann on that. What I'm going to present to you is really some of the background epidemiology as well as some recent findings. Um, this is a constantly changing um, uh, problem as are chronic conditions for us in, in epidemiology. And, I, and I'll provide these a bit of historical context, uh, some new data, and then also really the rationale and the framework for, for prevention um, as I kick that off to Ann. Um, briefly as background, I mentioned we've seen this massive increase over 20 years, it's about roughly a doubling. And it's, um, we can't really pick a single part of the population that is really responsible for this. It's basically taken um, all segments in, in different ways. The biggest absolute increase in terms of percentage point increase has been in older age. Um, the greatest relative increase has been in younger age. They're starting from a lower level, of course, over time. But, and actually the biggest volume, as in cases, is actually in middle age, and that's because the baby boom generation is moving into the age range when peak incidence is, or actually has moved there. Um, it's a whole nother talk and debate about what has contributed to this set, to this, these increases. You know, we have probably 30 modifiable risk factors for diabetes that have been identified, but it's really a smaller list that is really responsible for the changes over time. And, and it's really um, the increases in prevalence, the declines in physical activity, the changes in our diet, qualitative changes, um, the impact of, of sugary drinks, of increased fast food and portion sizes, and aging longer lifespan is also influencing what we're seeing in, in prevalence. Um, this describes our most recent data here from um, nationally representative surveys. 
It amounts to, in adults, about 12% of the population with diabetes, of, among whom about 9% um, are diagnosed. And if you look at some of the demographic variation, you see that apart from obesity, age is the biggest single uh, risk factor for diabetes. And you can see that, for example, those age 65 and older, we now have a prevalence of, of, of one-fourth, 25%. And the other big differences we do see is in race ethnicity, where we see, for example, whites having a total prevalence of around 9%, but non-Hispanic blacks and Asians um, and Hispanics all in the 16 to 17% prevalence. And then, of course, we see a large difference in education. And this is what the map, this is what the prevalence looks like nationally, at least based on diagnosed prevalence. And um, you see a lot of variation. We see two to three-fold variation according to where you live. We have what we've sort of identified as a diabetes belt, which is quite similar to what at, uh, at one point was uh, coined the stroke belt, but there are some differences to it. And you see some parts, areas that basically is those with uh, the, the dark purple or those with particularly high incidence rates. And you can see that apart from Mississippi Valley and the Carolinas, uh, some areas where particularly populated by Native Americans, um, and the other area here, West Virginia, and, and on up the Appalachians. So the predominant predictor of prevalence at the county level is actually poverty and persistent poverty. So although we think of race, particular race ethnic groups of having a high risk, uh, West Virginia is all largely white, and, but it's a high poverty state. So that's sort of where we are. Now let me provide to you some, some, some new data, some updates. Um, a few years ago, we published this paper in JAMA um, describing the prevalence and the incidence of diagnosed diabetes uh, nationally. And this is prevalence over here on this side um, over time. And you see this increase that occurred, like I just described to you, and you see the increase in incidence. But what we noted for the first time, actually, was no significant increase. Um, and we also noted no significant increase in incidence. Now, this looks like a decrease, but that, that was not technically a decrease. It was simply, uh, refer, we referred to it as a plateau, and this seemed like really encouraging news. Um, and we now actually have newer data. Um, that was five years ago, and this is actually under review right now, but if you look at prevalence, it's apparent that that plateau in prevalence has maintained. You see uh, now it's nine straight years. And then if you look at incidents, we actually see that this has continued to decrease as well. So we really can say right now, at least in terms of diagnosed diabetes, um, we don't know about total cases, but diagnosed diabetes, we can say that nationally there's a plateau in prevalence and a decrease in incidence. So we think we're starting to, to make a difference um, through, um, through, well, we'll come to, to how and, and why. The other thing I'll note about that, though, is if you look more specifically at the subgroups, and I'm sorry if this is a bit hard to read, but the decline in incidence really seems to be driven by older adults. We don't see that decline in um, middle age, age 45 to 64, or in younger adults, age 18 to 44. And similarly, if you look at race, ethnic, race ethnicity, you see that the decline seems to be driven by non-Hispanic whites, and there's not a significant decline in the other groups. So you can have a situation wherein there's a lot of cases contributed by older adults and a lot of cases con contributed by whites because it's the majority, or at least, uh, um, and, and driving the overall effect, but it doesn't mean that we're, we're winning in all groups. Um, now, it happens that, I mentioned we don't know exactly what's explaining this, but there are lots of hypotheses, and it happens that if you look at some of the other data of trends and risk factors nationally, there's some encouraging news. Now, it's not real clear which of these or to what extent these might influence those trends, that reduction in diabetes incidence, but there has been reported a peak and plateau in total dietary intake in the mid-2000s, decreases in added sugars and sugared beverages, increase in whole grains, fibers, nuts, and legumes. All of these are important factors for diabetes, a peak and pl plateau in fiscal inactivity, and it seems to be a plateau in obesity prevalence, at least in adults. Um, I will note that, again, this is diagnosed, so we don't really know about the impact of changing detection and diagnosis. Um, but, you know, these are all encouraging signs, but I remind you again that any time we're, we're um, portraying or interpreting national data, that's an average that 
is an assembly of lots and lots of variation. There can be big subgroups where we don't see that. So what are the challenges ahead? Um, well, first of all, these encouraging trends that we see in adults, we do not see for youth. And we don't actually have national data on trends in youth, but the, the closest thing we do have is a set of registries that suggest that particularly in non-whites, um, that the incidence of type 2 diabetes in youth has continued to increase um, over this, this last decade. So, um, and if this is a sign of what we're going to be um, having in the next 10 or 20 years, then this uh, contradicts what I described to you of those, that encouraging reduction. And similarly, we see uh, trends in obesity in youth that, that parallel what we see there. I'm going to move past that. Um, the other thing that we, um, as a parent, is that when we step back and consider diverse dietary, um, physical activity risk factors for diabetes, and assess the population and look at the proportion that are actually meeting ideal levels, we see um, in both men and women that actually the minority of the population are meeting um, really agreed upon targets goals. So if our goal is actually to get diabetes incidence and prevalence back to what it was in say the late 80s, early 1990s before we see that, that big increase, um, then you would really want to achieve much better um, you know, much, certainly much closer to a 100. We wouldn't want to be down here in the 20s and 30s for all of these targets. Um, another factor in the epidemiology that's important, though, and that is some, some good news. And, and we published this recently in Lancet showing what has happened to the mortality rate among people who already have diabetes. And what you see here is that this overall bar here is, is actually the, the mortality rate in the diabetic population. Different colors represent uh, groups of causes. These are vascular causes, these are cancers, and this is basically everything else. But what you see is that there's been a large reduction in the overall rate, particularly driven by this here in, in blue or purple, uh, that um, rate of cardiovascular disease related mortality. The point is that people with diabetes have, uh, have a much lower death rate than they used to due to a variety of, of factors. And when you take that information and you combine it with what we've observed with this increase in prevalence incidence, you put those two together, what you end up with is a big increase in lifetime risk. In other words, the probability that um, your average person who does not have diabetes will go on to develop diabetes before they die. Um, and this is what this graph rep represents is that, oh, a couple decades ago, a 20-year-old, average 20-year-old had perhaps a 25% a lifetime risk of developing diabetes. Now, based on um, uh, current estimates, it's, it's around 40 percent, and that's for both men and women. Um, and the other corollary that goes here with this is it means that the average number of years that a person spends with diabetes, once they develop it, is longer. This is simply more time, since diabetes does its damage basically in, in, in many ways over time, this is more years in which to basically accumulate uh, forms of complications and disability. So this is really why even if we see um, encouraging reductions in incidence, we, we really think that we still have a heavy burden ahead for the, for the decades that follow. So that sort of brings me to uh, the, the segue that I'd like to, um, you know, for Ann's talk, you know, what's our rationale, what's our framework for prevention? I, I think the data I just described to you serves as the rationale. Um, there's also a very strong evidence base that particularly, although there's work on um, the potential of medication um, effects, there's a particularly strong evidence base for the value of, I'm sorry, these are going to be hard to read, but basically you see anywhere from 40 to 60 percent reductions in incidence if you're able to identify high-risk people and get them into evidence-based uh, uh, long-term lifestyle change programs focused on diet quality, uh, dietary intake, and physical activity. And this is really the science that um, we feel that we need to act upon. Now, that raises the question of how to act, of which there's really many suggestions that have been raised. There's lots of options, and you can think of individual-focused options, structured, multi li multidisciplinary lifestyle approaches, metformin and other drugs, um, nutrition, education referral, more lower intensity, broader reach approaches, or you can think in terms of population-wide approaches, policy approaches where we try to influence uh, the community, the food environment, 
physical environment around us without the individual really uh, um, necessarily having to, to realize it. Um, and when we look through those different approaches, the one that has probably received the most evaluation outside of um, traditional trials is life stru structured lifestyle approaches. This is a paper published by actually uh, some faculty here, Mo Ali, you may know in, in um, Global Health. And what, he, what this shows here really is the efficacy that occurs with similar types of interventions across different non-clinical settings. Um, this is, these are weight loss outcomes, but basically these community trials achieve a weight loss over one year that's about two-thirds of what is achieved in the best trials. And that's, that's um, really not bad, and it would suggest that we can, when you think about the magnitude of decrease um, in diabetes incidence that you get with this intervention, this is really encouraging. Um, the cost-effectiveness data for lifestyle interventions is also very encouraging. Um, suggests this is a very high value intervention, um, particularly if it's done in a, in a group setting um, and particularly if it's done outside of clinical setting by, by uh, um, trained people in communities, and you're going to hear more from that um, from Ann. Um, but the, um, the one thing we have learned, or one of the things we've learned from our uh, analytic work though, is that if we're going to employ a structured intensive lifestyle intervention, then who we intervene upon really makes a difference in terms of cost effectiveness. And what this slide here describes is, on, the, on this x-axis, is our deciles of A1C. Now the same basically occurs if you, if you plot this by fasting glucose. But it's, it happens that the top two deciles, or 20 percent, of A1C contribute at least over a five to ten year period, they contribute 50 percent of the cases. The size of the circle represents the proportion of total cases. And so the, it ends up being very cost effective to act upon, to intervene upon them. But as you move down into the lower levels of A1C, it ends up not being very, co very cost effective. So this means that um, as we implement structured programs, we want to identify the higher risk people as much as possible. Um, however, another perspective that we're also aware of is that when we consider the population with prediabetes and the population with normal glucose, that the time horizon of our concern for prevention also affects how we want to act. If our time horizon is five or ten years, most cases come from that prediabetic population. But if our time horizon is 20 years and plus, then this group with normal glucose contributes actually just as many and ultimately more cases. So what this means is that not only do we need to act to reduce progression in these people, but we need to think about approaches that are going to work in, in the general population. And there's a growing evidence base there, too, for different policy approaches uh, to change um, intake of sugared beverages, to influence the um, walkability of neighborhoods, the availability and diversity of healthy foods, and um, to, to make a difference in these areas. So in essence, our sort of our principles as we um, develop a um, public health approach for prevention are, are the following. We, we ultimately, the ideally, we want to work through multiple avenues. Um, chronic conditions um, require multiple avenues. There's rarely do we have vaccines for us. Um, they need health systems, health promotion, and population-wide population policies need to include approaches for the high-risk population and the whole population, and this ultimately means uh, that we need a, a multi-tiered approach. So um, I'd like to summarize and then hand this to Ann. We see long-term increases in incidence and prevalence across all segments of the population. We see recent reductions in incidence and a flattening of prevalence. Um, we see favorable concomitant reductions in diabetes risk factors, but obesity tr tr trends remain unclear as do the impact of screening and detection. Um, absolute, however, a part of all that, absolute diabetes prevalence and population risk remains high, and we have particular concerns about youth. And so really, um, this is what has, leads us to, and, and why it's important to, to embark on a multi-tiered public health response. So thank you, and I will hand this now to Ann, and then um, I think we'll um, look forward to discussion after both of us have, have presented. 
Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming, and to all of you coming in remotely, thrilled that you're here to spend some time with us. Um, this really is an amazing time for our nation and really around the world for diabetes. Uh, our portfolio at CDC in the Diabetes Division absolutely focuses on those who have diabetes. We are working on preventing new cases of diabetes, and we are working to really address uh, such prominent um, health disparity issues, equity issues. So I'm going to share with you today one piece of our work, but it is considered by many to be the, the jewel in the crown, and did a really nice job to, in describing all that's going on and why we see what we're seeing today in uh, this state of diabetes, and why we need both the approaches of uh, focusing on the populations who are at high risk and having a structured lifestyle program that has strong evidence, and why we also need the environmental whole population approaches. I think, unfortunately, at some part of our evolution and work, uh, all of us working in this area, there's been this debate on it's either the high uh, risk population or it's the whole population. And, and honestly, it's not either or, it is absolutely both. I will be focusing my rest of my remarks, though, on the structured lifestyle intervention to share with all of you what has gone on in, for the first time in our nation, which is the building of the National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is taking this lifestyle intervention and implementing it nationwide. We have never done that as a country. We have a pretty impressive medication distribution system in our country, but we have no lifestyle distribution system in our country. So that's what I'm going to describe for you now. I think we've made it pretty clear uh, we have a significant public health problem, although there are still some who do not yet acknowledge that diabetes is a really preeminent public health problem in our nation. I, I hope this pretty much says it all and all of the data that Ed showed you. And the fact that diabetes itself is a condition is really uh, at the, it's almost like dropping a rock in a pond. Diabetes, all the rings that emanate out from it, the usual complications, heart attack, stroke, blindness, amputation, kidney failure, and now as Ed described, we've also got Alzheimer's, dementia, hearing loss. They're taking over now a greater proportion of infectious diseases like sepsis and other things going Going on. So diabetes, if we can address diabetes, we are actually going to be addressing a myriad of other health conditions. And I think it's important to think about that because sometimes people say, well, we don't want to be disease specific. Well, guess what? <laughs> we, we need to be. And by focusing on diabetes, you actually are focusing on uh, innumerable other conditions. Um, Ed has shared with you, I just wanted to also reemphasize this, though, because if we think we have a problem now, we, we really ain't seen nothing yet unless we truly implement evidence that we have and things that we know work, and we implement them in a way that is actually going to be scalable and sustainable and that we really are putting our muscle behind doing that instead of settling for sort of little pilots in various places. Pilots are fine, but you better move beyond them or we're never gonna get a public health answer to this public health challenge. I just wanted to reemphasize, as far as this lifestyle intervention, we have a myriad of evidence. Could we have more? Sure, you can always have more. But it would actually be unethical if we do, did not move forward in implementing the evidence that we have. And besides, there's also many evaluations and examinations and studies that you need to do during implementation and scaling. We've got to move from randomized trials to efficacy trials to implementation studies and then to evaluating while we are truly implementing and scaling and sustaining work. This is a favorite slide of mine. I, I'm a huge music lover. I'm particularly a blues and rhythm and blues lover, but this is my homage to rock and roll. I call this a stairway to heaven. So this is really showing us what's going on here in really basic science. We have molecular physiologic responses. We need to continue to look at that. For those of us that live with diabetes, we are alive today because of these discoveries and they must continue. They will also help us understand mechanisms so we can better address treatments. 
you've heard uh, briefly about uh, some of the clinical trials that have been done. Ed showed you that slide that had a, a number of them, and they've been done around the world. The DPP, or the Diabetes Prevention Program, is the preeminent one in the U.S., but we have trials from all over the world now. We also then move to these effectiveness studies. These are the real-world studies. This is where CDC and, and NIH sort of do a baton handoff. We work with NIH and continue to partner with them very closely in, in a lot of their diabetes work and our diabetes work. We helped uh, fund the DPP trial. We continue to work with them on the outcomes trial. But then we need to do these real world studies. So things like, can you implement this intervention, which is a year long? First six months, uh, participants meet approximately weekly. Second six months, they meet approximately monthly for one hour. And I know some of you are saying, oh, I'll never get my patients to go to something for a year. They'll never go. Well, I think that's what we need to reframe this whole discussion. Do you give your patients half their medication? Do you give them a stop in the middle of a procedure and tell them it's time to go home? We don't do that. So why would we treat lifestyle like we, uh, we wouldn't treat other treatments? What we have to do is reframe that for, for folks. It's about 24 hours of someone's life that they're spending in this. What would you do with 24 hours to really improve your health? We've begun to frame it as you get to be in the program for a year, not you have to be in the program. We also are trying to work with folks to make sure they have transportation, if child care is needed. We can tackle the issues that need to be tackled as opposed to all wringing our hands over saying, oh, it's a year, it's a year. It takes time to make behavior change. So these efficacy trials have helped us understand how to reduce the cost, how to make them more implementable in the real world. Fortunately, we have evidence that shows that this intervention can be delivered by both health professionals and trained lay people, like staff at a YMCA, like people who work at Black Women's Health Imperative, like folks who work at senior centers. So we can be implementing this, this intervention all over the place by all kinds of people. And that's good news, because we've got 84 million potential participants in the program, and it's all hands on deck, so we better get serious about it. So these trials in this stairway have led us, this stair step have led us to that. Now, we often falter in the middle of the stairway. We all are high on the evidence, we're keen on the studies, and then we all sort of look around at the evidence and say, geez, we need to do something about this. So we better get ourselves to the top of the stairway, or all that research is for naught. All those investments for nothing. So how do we get ourselves to the top of the stairway? Well, we better make sure we're having the biggest effect on the most people. We better be sure that there's availability and we have a supply. And we also better make sure that we're having a good diffusion of the intervention so we are addressing these disparities or these inequities and not widening them. So how are we getting ourselves to the top of the stairway, or in this case, the, the heaven of preventing type 2 diabetes in our country? It is by, as I said, implementing this structured lifestyle intervention nationwide. And the National Diabetes Prevention Program that I will be briefly describing to you, and I could not possibly do it justice in the time we have, but I hope to give you a real flavor and encouragement and action that for, to take advantage of this intervention. But the National DPP is actually a whole entire enterprise that is being built for our country. And it is bringing together all kinds of stakeholders. It is bringing together employers, insurers, healthcare systems, healthcare professionals of all sorts. It's bringing together community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, universities, all kinds of stakeholders. And that's what is really necessary to get done what we need to do. We also is giving us, by the way, a target to shoot for. So everybody is not shooting out all over the place, that we're all pointing our arrows to the same bullseye. It's important to point out that this lifestyle intervention does allow customization for the person going through it. It's not, it, yes, there are the parameters of the lifestyle intervention itself and the, the structure that you're following, but it allows the coach to customize to the needs of the participant in the program. So for cultural issues, for food preferences, for life circumstances, it also allows these folks to work in a group that they can learn from each other, support each other, and the evidence is clear that's very important. The intervention is also delivered in person and virtually through all sorts of virtual modalities, whether it's telehealth, it's, it's through online, it's through distance learning, all of those things. 
So we're taking this big enterprise and we have really built it around four key components. And that's why I'm trying to share with you, it's not only the delivery of the lifestyle intervention, but it is these four pillars, if you will. It is building the workforce. And I shared with you that we can have both health professionals and trained lay people. And I hope that's of comfort and support for all of you so that it helps you know you don't have to carry this entire load by yourself. We're trying to be sure that we're bringing plenty of folks to the table and folks who are trained. So that brings me to the second component, which is around ensuring quality. Well, CDC is the overall manager and uh, the one who's really um, sort of laid out the infrastructure for this program, conceived of all of this. We are doing none of this without a vast array of partners all over the country, all over the world now, actually. But what CDC is doing in the National Diabetes Prevention Program, we call it the National DPP for short, is that we have also established the quality assurance arm. There are now national standards for this program. Organizations come in for recognition from CDC. We collect their data. We provide technical assistance to them. And we provide ongoing monitoring and reporting on all of the outcomes of these programs on behalf of the country. The third is the actual delivery of the uh, intervention itself. And that, as I mentioned earlier, is where it's going on all over the place. It's going on in senior centers, church basements. It's actually going on in the boardroom of a car dealership. It's going on anywhere and everywhere, and online as well, wherever people gather, wherever it's easiest for them to engage. And also, this is where we work on payment. And payment has been a big part of our work. And I'll mention something about that in just a moment. And then finally, if you build it, they don't necessarily come. And that is, I know, also a concern and thought that we all have. But I really want to emphasize to all of you, and I say this to every audience I address, and we'll say it as I leave today to go to the newly formed Clinical Care Commission by Congress, is to say that if we do not crack the nut on behavior change and engaging people more long term, we might as well throw away every single intervention that requires that people have to engage. And we better work on only passive interventions, because in order to really make changes on these chronic conditions that require behavior change, we must put a lot more of our research dollars, a lot more of our focus on behavioral science and on how we engage and retain people in interventions, whatever it may be, medication, lifestyle, anything that requires long term. So the strategic goals of the National DPP, these are inextricably linked to each other. We've moved from those four pillars to these national strategic targets, and we are laser focused on these with all of our partners. And we hope we count you amongst those partners. Increasing the supply of quality programs, increasing the demand by participants for the program, also increasing referrals from healthcare providers, that is key and also uh, getting increasing coverage among public and private payers. So let me tick off each of these and just give you a quick status on where we are with each of those. So how about increasing quality programs? I mentioned the recognition standards. These really are a linchpin. The standards are reviewed every three years. They are open for public comment. And are they perfect? No, but the proverbial, you know, don't let uh, it be the enemy of, of good. Uh, we have, these are strong standards, but they are realistic and reasonable. People ask us all the time, geez, we'd like to know this. Could we collect that? Could we collect this? Well, yeah, we could ask these organizations to collect it, and then we add to their burden. This is implementation. This is not a, a trial. This is not a study. This is actually implementing and evaluating. So we stick to those standards. They are primarily around weight loss and attendance and minutes of physical activity because those are the main drivers for type 2 diabetes prevention. Here are the benefits of CDC recognition. And I will highlight the one that the significantly greater number, in fact, now it's really most of them, are requiring CDC recognition for the uh, payers uh, to provide uh, payment. I just wanted to briefly highlight that CDC has also got our skin in the game. We have investments because a big part of what we are doing is helping organizations get stood up so that they can then enter into the payment system in our country. So we have funded everybody from all state health departments who have done things like work on Medicaid coverage at the state level, work on getting state employer coverage, state employee coverage. It has also been having them work on driving traffic to programs, and it has also been funded groups like, as I mentioned, America's Health Insurance Plan, Black Women's Health Imperative, 
chronic disease directors. It's a whole array of organizations that we have been funding. But it comes together to a very strong portfolio of work that really does end up trying to get more programs up and in place so there's a place for people to go or getting them virtually and then also driving traffic and now a lot of our work has been very focused on getting programs in places where there are none and getting these populations who are, are relatively underserved relative to their burden. So a lot of emphasis now. I bet you might be a bit surprised but one of the populations we're focusing on are men. Men have a slightly higher prevalence of prediabetes, but they are underutilizers of lifestyle. So we are studying and examining things. We found that if virtual offerings, they tend to be more likely to go to those and to complete the program. We're also obviously looking at all high-risk ethnic groups, as well as those with disabilities. So you can see sort of the trajectory of our work and our partners' work. So where are we now? These are the latest, although these change daily, so these are already higher than what you see here because we're at October 30th. But we have about 1,700, almost 1,800 programs in the country right now. And uh, this gives you a little bit of a picture for what this looks like. These are only the in-person programs, but it also tells you why we're making investments in some of the places we are in the nation where there are gaps in the program. So what about our next strategic goal, increasing demand for the program? Well, I'd like you all to engage with me here. Um, we have spent a lot of time trying to raise awareness about prediabetes because only one in 10 who have it know they have it. So we have some work to do. So we joined forces with the American Medical Association, who's been a great partner. Love them or hate them. For us, they're a great partner. Uh, they are also working with the American Diabetes Association and the Ad Council. And we have launched the first ever national prediabetes awareness campaign. This is, we're about to kick our third phase off on November 14th. Please check it out. But what I'm going to do is play you something from phase two. Our first phase, we use humor through these because we're trying to engage people, not scare them. We're trying to give them a firm tap on the shoulder. So this is really about first around, we use bacon guy and busy mom. I'll let your imaginations run wild there with a humorous doctor. And this second phase, folks, and I know some of you are in this room, people have a minute to look at cute videos, so why don't we have them use the minute to take the risk test to determine where they stand with their prediabetes risk. And the one we're launching soon is really going to be terrific. For all of those of you that have seen the Geico ads, we had the producers for the Geico ads do this next round. So if you don't know your prediabetes risk, I encourage you to share this with everybody. Go to do I have prediabetes.org and I'd like you to mentally take this risk test with us. As a result of this campaign, we now have almost 3 million people in our country who know their risk. So we will continue that work and encourage you all to share this. Really, we've got physicians who are uh, playing this in. It's being played all over the country in, in uh, clinician offices. Uh, the Ad Council has some particular parameters. But if we can help you in any way to spread the word, help you work with your patients, we are here to do that. Um, also, some of the other strategies we're doing focus very much in on these behavioral uh, change strategies. We are working on a number of things in one of our branches that is really the translation branch. It is a promotion of social referrals, and I'm happy to share any more information about this during our Q&A. We're optimizing something being referred to as session zero. Uh, we are really digging deep now into ways in which we can engage and retain people, trying to really maximize, work with populations who are closest to those we're trying to serve, and really test and evaluate um, using various strategies to get people in and to keep them in the program. 
So how are we doing with that? How many people we've got in? Now we're almost up to 250,000. Uh, and this is not all the people in the program. These are the people for whom we have data at this time. So there are more people in there. So we're at about a quarter of a million. Uh, we at CDC and our, uh, have now pu pushed a stake in the ground. We're looking to try to get a million and enrolled in the program by about uh, 2025, if not before. So what about this third goal about getting referrals? Please really take advantage of this. Uh, CDC and all of our colleagues have been working very hard to really uh, position clinicians to play to your strength. Um, we do not want you to have to carry any more burden and load than you already do. So let this program help you. Um, we have a lot of things going on with partners, as I mentioned, everybody from AMA to American College of Preventive Medicine uh, to uh, the Y and our state grantees. We're actually looking at a lot of things related to the electronic health record. I know for some of you that's the bane of your existence, but it's also trying to use that tool to better uh, facilitate referrals. Uh, Ed's team led a study, it's one of our natural experiments, that did indeed show that if it's in the EHR, that the amount of screening and referral does go up. We do have to be concerned about over-testing, but uh, that is a, a definite tool. So what about this final one, increasing coverage? We all know that people will not engage if there is not some kind of coverage for them. This is where we have spent a lot of time with our payers and partners. Our goal is that this is all payer coverage, all payers, because everybody has a stake in this. I don't care what health plan you are, if you think, well, they'll leave me, they'll go on Medicaid, or they will, why should I invest? We have 84 million people with prediabetes. They're leaving you, but some are coming right in behind them. Certainly Medicaid and Medicare have to care. So everybody has skin in the game. So it has been our goal to work with both private and public sectors. So here's how it looks. This is just a sampling of some of the health plans who are paying for coverage. And it's a question I'm asked most. Anne, can you give us a complete list of all the insurers that pay for this intervention? And no, I can't, because I'm sure you all know well that payers, whether you're employed by a particular employer or whether your health plan is covering in particular parts of the country for particular sectors, we have a fairly complicated system in this country. Country. But we can certainly help you find out who is paying for it, and if it isn't in your system, make it so. This gives you a flavor of where we are with state employee coverage. Oftentimes, state employer, states are the biggest employer in a, in a state. So with our, our health departments, this is what we have achieved now with 19 states uh, having state employee coverage. I wanted to really just close with Medicaid and Medicare. Medicare, for the first time in history, is providing coverage for a lifestyle intervention that can be delivered inside or outside the healthcare setting. They've never done it before. So this has really been quite a trajectory and quite a path. So because of establishing the national DPP, because we had already worked with commercial payers, you know, everybody tells you, if you get Medicare, all the commercial plans will follow. Well, fortunately, we didn't follow that conventional wisdom. We'd been planting seeds with CMS, but we plowed right on with commercial payers as well. And that set us up. Because of our funding that I shared with you earlier, those investments that we made, we funded the Y as one of our partners. They were able to successfully compete for this model test. We got actuarial certification, again, a first, based on our data from the recognition program and because of some of the studies that Ed's team has led, this data all have supported this work. We went through rulemaking. If you ever get a chance to go through this, it's quite a ride. And then we got the final rule, the Medicare DPP, which is part of the national DPP. It's referred to as Medicare DPP or MDPP for short. It went live April 1 of this year. And so now all Medicare beneficiaries, with part, and I'll show you this is the, the payment amount that can be obtained from that. They can get a total, uh, the, the uh, delivery organization can get a total of about $670 for, per beneficiary, but it does depend on attendance and it does depend on weight loss. Medicare has also decided to cover this intervention for two years instead of one, so we'll have an additional year of ongoing maintenance. And I'm happy to answer questions about this um, because there's quite a bit behind all of this work. So I um, also wanted to let you know that we're working on getting Medicaid coverage. We've launched demonstration projects. We have about nine states now that do have Medicaid coverage, and we will continue with that work. 
And in closing, I just want to let you know that because this uh, enterprise is getting so large, we have created a customer service center that gives people sort of the first tier is serve yourself. You can get on for all of our webinars, videos, fact sheets, all kinds of things that we have. We also um, use Salesforce to run this uh, customer service center so that people can come in with their requests. A case will be open to address your, your question. And we give, you give access to uh, CDC subject matter experts. We also now have secured the um, uh, subject matter expertise from outside experts, uh, those who are specialists in insurance coverage and in setting up programs and those kinds of things. We are just about, uh, we are now formulating a national operations center for this. If you right next door to CDC, you know we have what's called the Emergency Operating Center there, the EOC for outbreaks. Well, we are now establishing an operations center for the national DPP. So we and all of our partners really are committed to getting this part of the uh, prevention puzzle scaled widely in this country and sustained. And this is really our opportunity. When history looks back on this time, what will they say about what we did? Did we continue to see the trajectory go up, or will we, as Ed shared with you in the data, continue to see it go down for the right reasons, that we are preventing new cases through lifestyle and policy system and environmental change and through appropriate diagnosis, or will we turn the tide and continue to just be devastated by diabetes? So if you're not already involved, let us help you be involved in the national DPP. Thanks. And we'll answer whatever questions you have for Ed and me. Thanks for that uh, great overview uh, and your efforts in this really important area. Uh, questions, I, I have a couple. One is you talk mostly about type 2 diabetes, which is the, the major issue, but certainly there are medical, significant medical complications for type 1. Can you comment on type 1 and, and your efforts around type 1, and is there any change in incidence of type 1, which is a totally different disease? The second is the sustainability question of the lifestyle interventions, and uh, one kind of specific one, it looked like a 4% reduction overall in weight makes a significant difference, yet the metric that you showed for reimbursement was 5 to 9% uh, weight reduction. Why that difference, and can you comment on the sustainability of the lifestyle interventions? Let, let me start with the second question, and then we'll turn to type 1, also something very near and dear to my heart. Um, the sustainability, those trials that I shared with you, the, particularly the outcomes trial, and Ed can address the, the longest running prevention trial in the world, the Dow Ching trial, has shown that there is continued benefit from the intervention now at 15 years post the intervention. The Dow Ching is hitting, what, 25 years now post Dow Ching trial. So this intervention does have a legacy effect. So it is worth um, implementing and, and sustaining. The weight loss difference, actually in the DPP trial, it was 7% weight loss, but people tended to get, in many cases, closer to five, so that's why it's five to 7% weight loss for the national standards. Um, our national average in the program right now is 6%. So yes, there is benefit from every uh, percent weight loss, but if you're really gonna try to meet those trial outcomes, then you really need to be getting more in the 5 to 7% weight loss. 9% is used for a quote unquote bonus payment. And some of the health plans have decided to do that and Medicare decided to follow suit. So it's really intended to encourage additional weight loss if necessary. Um, so sustainability is definitely there. The real issue around sustainability is having people stay in the program and complete it, and which is really intended to help them achieve longer-term behavior changes. But it also emphasizes why we need to change the environment in which we're all living in. Because as people go through this program, it doesn't help if they're returning to locations and, and environments that are completely unsupportive of that lifestyle. So it's why it's really that two-pronged approach. And did you have any more comments on that particular um, question? No, I think you covered it well. I guess the, the, the one thing I would add is there, there are some technical aspects about the weight loss differences in terms of actually it comes down to whether you measure it in people who have attended any visits versus not. And, and so some of the trials that I described are, are very conservative because if a person didn't attend any visits at all they, but were still randomized to the intervention, they get counted. Uh, so that's why um, 
you know, the, the, there's, um, you know, the threshold goals vary a bit. In terms of your question on type 1 diabetes, uh, type 1 incidence is increasing, um, not at the, um, in, in youth, not at the magnitude of increase of type 2. We don't really have a real clear reason for why that is, but, um, you know, the issues of type 1, for that matter, um, all the complications that follow type 2 means that, you know, a big part of what we do in the division is, is from a uh, surveillance standpoint, but also from a programmatic standpoint, focusing on continuing to, to reduce complications. Yeah, the work we're doing for all people with diabetes, type 1 and type 2, around preventing those complications or the worsening, a big focus of our work is the implementation of diabetes self-management education support. I actually hit 50 years with type 1 diabetes this year, so um, I'm very much uh, a proponent of making sure everybody gets access, because in the olden days, and it's so weird to say that, actually today's my 60th birthday, so I can really say that, in the olden days, <laughs> thank you, um, we had none of these things, we had no pump no continuous sensors, no self-management education, but it's now because we have them, people need to learn how to use them. You know, just because they have them doesn't mean people are learning to use them well. So a lot of it is on, on equipping people and then making sure that they can access them and use the information appropriately. So we're very committed to helping those live successfully with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Thank you. I have a couple off-site questions. Um, so there's curiosity on how physicians can refer patients to the local DPP programs. Can you speak on that? Yes. Um, it, there are, we have a locator on our website. Uh, so it is um, CDC, uh, www.cdc.gov slash diabetes slash prevention. And on there will be a locator map. Um, we are working very hard to improve that locator map. And honestly, if that person is, whoever's asking that question, if you have any concerns, you can contact our customer service center and we will help you. We will help you locate them. We don't want you to struggle. We're trying to get our locator much more effective. I never knew establishing a locator could be so darn difficult. Ultimately, our dream is to make it much easier for that referral to come in and for people to actually sign up for the program. But we're a ways away from that. But we want to make it easier for people to know where the program is. Awesome. Um, and what are the specific interventions included in the CDC certified programs? Yeah, there, the structured curriculum is a focus on healthy eating. There is, a, a, people do set a fat gram and calorie goal. And for some, that's now increasingly causing frustration or concern because there is increasing evidence about diet quality versus a diet focusing on a particular macronutrient. But the randomized trials have used this dietary intervention, although we are about to embark on a, a serious look at the diet um, sort of increasing evidence around diet. It does focus on people getting 150 minutes of physical activity a week, building up to that. But a significant amount of the curriculum focuses on problem solving, coping, really identifying those barriers, and helping people stop negative thinking. So it is a multi-part uh, intervention, but also intended to get right to the point and not try to pepper people with just tons of other information. You know, there's sort of the KISS principle here. Let's, if people could do just those things, we'd get a lot farther. Um, but as a registered dietitian, I'd be remiss in not saying, please also take advantage of medical nutrition therapy. There are people who need more than this, and there are people who would really prefer to, uh, to do MMT. But we have a lot of dietitians who are coaches in the program as well. I have a, a theoretical question. It's, I mean, I'm very impressed with how well thought out this is, and I think it's a terrific program. But there is a different strategy that can be used in a public health uh, effort, which is sort of the population-based strategy. I mean, you can have ads on TV that reaches the entire population. You can teach this in the schools that reaches every kid in every school or every college. So why? Why not go with a population-based uh, strategy to reach, you know, a very large audience with these uh, relatively common sense and important uh, sort of lifestyle recommendations? Yeah, it's a, such a, a great question. 
That has already been going on and been going on for a long time. I mean, we have lots of campaigns around healthy eating. Move more, eat less. We, we've had lots of, of healthy eating campaigns. There are efforts going on in schools now, all the kinds of things. Uh, kids are now with school lunches. There are things going on around, uh, there are now um, gardens that are being started in schools. So there are all kinds of things. We need to have that work going on with, with actually in utero. We need uh, pregnant moms, uh, since a lot of that is programming is done while the, the baby's in utero. So there is work going on in that area. We have a maternal and child health division in our, in our center. So they're carrying that part of the load. And then we've got the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. They're working on breastfeeding, early childhood development. So those are still, though, focused on groups of people. Then are, are we step in for those that have prediabetes and diabetes, and then our colleagues in heart disease and stroke. We also, by the way, have the Chronic Kidney Disease Initiative in our division and the uh, Vision Health Initiative. So I guess my response directly is those kinds of campaigns are already going on. They have been going on, but they're not moving our needs needle enough. That's why Ed presented to you also some of the other kinds of whole population. So that would be everybody. That's why things like reformulating our food, and some of that is going on. That's truly a whole population approach, is if we are, are formulating our foods differently so they have less sodium and less sugar in them, no trans fats. Those are happening. Even some of the things like sugar sweetened beverage tax, that still requires people to make a choice, right? It's not passive. So people still have to make choices, even with these seemingly whole population approaches. That's why if we can do things that are passive, like reformulation, people don't even have to think about it. That's what was done with, you know, for folic acid and other things. So we're, we're, we're working on those things, and others around the country and around the world are working on those. So it is this multifaceted approach that Ed mentioned. It is focusing across the age continuum. It's using interventions, though, that have good evidence, and then it's also working on things that are appropriate for the entire population. I, do you mean specifically, so the question was what public entity is doing something around, do you mean specifically the... And it's, and it's, so it's eat and drink. So it's basically what companies, what businesses are, are joining forces. Well, there, there are actually a number of them. It depends on how you view their participation. Um, you may certainly recall Michelle Obama during the Obama administration did have um, the Let's Move campaign and they did work with industry. Uh, so people are working with, whether it's Pepsi, Coke, any of those to encourage more of their water products as opposed to their soda products. People are working with some of the restaurant uh, industry to try to, again, um, encourage smaller portion sizes. Some are encouraging strategies like taking half of your meal home and they'll have signs or things posted in their places of business. So there are a number of them. It's a question of what's happening really nationwide to have an impact. It's why this is multifaceted, but the things we choose to work on and really all get behind need to be sort of a, a, a good selection of them, but not anything and everything. Because you can put posters up, you can do this and that. Those can kind of help as background, provided they're not confusing. So there are industry partners that are involved. People, as I said, have varying views on that, on their, their industry participation. But some who feel strongly about it feel if you don't have them in, you'll never get anywhere. Great, thank you very much. This was